hey, what do you think about caste? Just ask this. Of all the things. Hear the response. Document it. Look at critically how they will evade it. Even in their acknowledgement, they will evade it. Now we know it's a problem. Uh, but it's changing. Changing for who? You, your siblings, who made it here in Canada or in America, or who are actually having the ownership of major companies in India? No, no, no. You know, they had a, a Dalit chief minister. When? 10 years ago? And when we are talking about her, you are telling her she's corrupt in the second breath. Oh no, you know what? Caste was a thing of the past. Now it doesn't operate in a similar way. Now it has changed. What does that mean? Has that changed the life of Dalits or the Adivasis operating on a receiving end? Has it made a change to the three Dalit women? They are still raped every day in the society. And the people who stand defensive to the caste are the people who are participating in the rapes of Dalit women that are happening in this country. Until and unless this becomes part of our everyday dialogue. Caste is a footnote to every other problem that we have in India. Caste should be the primary introductory intervention in whatever we do in India. You will talk about issues affecting Kashmiris. You will talk about the issues affecting Muslims. You will talk about the issues affecting Sikhs. You will talk about the issues affecting Dalits. Then Adivasis. Then, because it has become almost like a, a carnival of these many solidarity movements. Why not talk about Dalit issues as you talk about Kashmir issues? As and when we talk about caste becoming an issue, people always make sure caste doesn't become an issue. You talk to any liberal, any radical, any progressive and talk to on their face. Do this test. So I hope you all will join me in welcoming Dr. Siraj Yende. Thank you so much, Doug. A very warm Jai Bhim to you. Today as I was uh, coming uh, into the airport and uh, people were very excited to know and you know when Sardarji was, uh, was the, the immigration guy and he was, uh, he got instantly uh, hooked to the whatever I was talking about and then uh, I, was, I was almost guessing that if he had no job <laughs> hours he would have joined me <laughs> to, to come <laughs> that's how much enthusiasm and I think that was a positive sign because um, usually the, the immigration, the borderization of our lives has become so contentious that we feel unwanted and we feel almost untouchables of every other land we go into. Um, that experience was a little bit heartwarming and I would like to thank Sarah and Doug and the excellent team of many co-sponsors who have put together this event and, and more specifically uh, to run this fourth uh, annual BR Ambedkar Lecture Series lecture series under the name of Ambedkar happening every year and with the continuity and with the same affection and love deserves a second round of applause. So whoever is part of them, let's give it up in the name of Ambedkar and as well as the people who are working uh, to, to and for the movement. A few weeks ago, 10 year old boy and 12 year old girl uh, from Balmiki community, uh, Manoj's uh, son, and there was another girl uh, in Madhya Pradesh in India uh, were on their way to meet their grandfather. And as it happens, uh, due to lack of uh, access to toilets, uh, these two uh, kids uh, went for nature's call. They went for nature's call and their dead bodies came outside. This reminds me of an incident taking back us to Ambedkar's when he was going uh, to meet his father, a subedar in an army, along with his siblings, uh, and gets down on uh, railway station. And of course, the Tangewala, the carriage, uh, inquires. And because looking at the posh clothes on the Smahar untouchables uh, uh, kids, uh, he would not guess their caste. And so he happily gets the um, gets the uh, the fare that they are offering, and then they are going together and then in the meanwhile uh, Bhim is thirsty and by in, in, in the journey uh, the Tangewala discovers the caste of these three untouchable kids who are actually uh, going to meet a Subedar again a reputed post but in spite of the posh clothes they had in spite of the jewelry they were sporting uh, the casteist eyes could not see the humanity 
beyond that and even under that they were still term untouchables and bhim rao young bhim had to undergo that trauma so much so that he remembers this in his worst fears times when he is in baroda where he's heckled by the parsi gundas uh, the thugs uh, belong to the parsi community as well as the hindu community uh, who by the way a colombia graduate a phd uh, who's going to work uh, in 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 in, in sayajirao was government uh, that an untouchable cannot live uh, in the same status as us and even though he is paying same money in the hotel his caste is unacceptable and so ambedkar is sobbing and ambedkar is in fear and ambedkar is thinking about the worth of his life coming here in 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 1916 and engaging with a galaxy of thinkers and philosophers golden wiser john dewey and when goes back is still an untouchable and this episode reminiscence with this time ambedkar was fortunate to not have witnessed the life of this kids belong to the balmikis ambedkar survived and ended up writing india's constitution these two beautiful souls were not lucky enough this is the kind of issue this is the torment that we are facing today today in contemporary india students across the campuses are undergoing brunt one particular student whose mother is still waiting to hear that one day he will come back we don't know what's happening with the abducted lives in india right now and therefore today and even yesterday and even tomorrow the even is important because yet we might pass legislations yet we might take our social movements to a phase yet we might try to convince our family and societies yet we try to transgress our own wretched minds still the counting of dalit dead bodies is not receding it is but kept kept keep on increasing day by day the statistics that we have to identify when people ask about the importance of caste we have to look at the human development index what does it say there are three important factors uh, among many others that factor in one is uh, the level of income and poverty second is the idea of nutrition as to how much a nutrition third is education and if you look through these three uh, variables we will be we will be able to identify the existence of caste in our everyday day to day lives and again when i call upon caste issues i also want to call upon the privileges of the caste people so caste doesn't work only with the levy of dalit suffering only but the brahmins and the dominant caste belonging to various other folds enjoying the privileges and enjoying the death as well as the rape of people who belong to the lower caste so caste has to be put in relation it has to be relative often it cannot be one sided discourse and therefore when we think and when we talk about poverty today one percentage the top one percentage of indians own 60% of india's wealth digest that one more time top 1% own 60% of india's wealth and we are talking about 1.4 billion people a huge mass of land top 10 own 80% of india's wealth which means 89% of the people have to fight over 20% of india's resources and when we don't have any other avenue to express our frustration we go out after the most vulnerable the most insecure person of our society because that person is the easy target you cannot go against the one percentage because you know there is a word in hindi aukat you know you can't deal with the top 1% because if you are caste sensitive you will ensure that the fight doesn't go against the top 1 or top 10% it goes against the lower and people who are operating on the lowest level and here's the fun fact the 25 richest indians 25 richest indian own 10% of india's gdp 25 individuals owning of 10% of india's gdp how does caste factor in 
the richest of these people, 50% belong to Brahmin communities. Brahmins are 3% of India's population, yet own 50% of India's resources. And not only 50% of India's resources, they continue to be on the richest spectrum. Meaning if you are richest, you are the worst exploiter of a society. That means 50% of the worst exploiters in this country belong to the 3% Brahmins. And if you add the Rajputs, they own 44% of India's wealth. And if you go slide down more according to the caste hierarchy and Varnas, the Kayasts who operate as the uh, pet Brahmins in our societies, not having a full status of their own, trying to imagine their wet dreams of becoming a Brahmin one day, yet they are not Brahmins. Getting beaten up by Brahmins every now and then and yet enjoying the privileges by oppressing someone else. This kind of dilemma of Kayasts and again Banyas, they own 57% together. How do we account to the disparity? This disparity is an outcome of our caste blindedness when we have given safe passages to people who are actually utilizing the existing state as well as non-state resources, amassing the wealth for their own caste people. When we talk about neoliberal capitalism, the so-called promises of privatization as well as globalization that was supposed to offer a certain kind of freedom, it told us in on our face that if we bring capitalism to you, you will be liberated. It told us with a sense of confidence that one day capital will come to your rescue. What has happened? 92% of corporate board members belong to Brahmin and Banya communities in India. 92. Who is neoliberal regime supporting? What are they problematizing when they have to actually talk about Brahmins singularly owning 45% of corporate board seats when it comes to the capitalist or the global enterprises in India. And, and of course, the rest of the percentage goes to Banya. Here, the Khatris, the Kshatriyas, what we call, do not fall into the numbers. Scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, 25% of the population in total only has 3.5% of share in the, Golo, in the corporate board memberships. A quarter of population, less than 4% sitting in important corporate board decisions. So your Twitters and your Facebooks and your Walmarts and all your fancy businesses from the West as well as the non-West capitalist enterprise operating in India has actually helped the casteist demagogues in India to utilize the neoliberal capitalism and the jargons of capitalist enterprise to further put down the people who should have instead fighting against the very order that has helped. And this is what talks about the loyalty of Brahmins. Brahmins have been, been the most disloyal citizens of India. They have never remained loyal to a country called India Republic or pre-republic too. When the Mughals came, they rushed to them to become their special advisors. If Shivaji had his one part been having a mark on his body, it was a Brahmin who was fighting against Shivaji. And then when we talk about colonial regime, during the British times, the excellent advisors, the Brahmins, rushed to the English schools, went to the, Brahmin, went to the British, asked to establish and retain their supremacy by becoming again the special advisors. Pre-Mughal times, there was Adil Shahi, there was Delhi Sultanate. Pre that times, there was Chandragupta Maurya's kingdom. Who was the chief advisor of Chandragupta Maurya? Brahmin Kautilya, who drafted the vicious political treatise that India has known. A punitive measures against women, lower caste. He wrote Chanakya Niti. When British come, Brahmins sit on their laps to enjoy the breads and, and enjoy the sweats of the people who are actually working day and night into the field. In contemporary times, when neoliberalism come as a new regime, a new Raj, Brahmins, again with the indi in indicators that we have numbers, enjoying their unaccounted and unchallenged privilege in the society. When we talk about nutrition, nutrition level is so deficient. The Dalit kids, 40% of Dalit kids 
do not have enough nutrition they don't celebrate their 6th birthday lack of access to health is primary reasons for dalit infant mortality anemia anemia is caused due to the lack of hemo- hemoglobin in blood 60.5 percentage of dalit kids fall under the category of anemia patients whose result goes into death and when we are trying to understand the lifestyle of these people we have to also focus on what is happening on the other side of the spectrum what is happening to the people who are belonging to the savarna caste or the twice born castes how are they performing in 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 this in this in this spectrum let's look at the richest indians and the on the percentage of them in 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 this categories only 5% of scheduled tribes fall into the category of richest indians now you have to compare that 5% with the amount of the total general ratio the policy makers in india are very funny sometimes to make them feel good they play around this these variables they have declared that 5% of adivasi fall into the top richest category of all the indians and if you ask for evidence it's a very scathing uh, uh, criticisms that you are given they say you don't ask for the top 1% but now you want to ask for the scheduled tribes so asking who claim to be the 5% of richest indians what is happening here the legitimization of thagari you are using the marginalized names their paltry contribution or representation into certain as a tokenized form of presence to parade this as a as a representative of an entire community and therefore it is here where the challenge comes where in contemporary times the dalit or adivasis are becoming the tokens at the hands of dominant hindutva regime they neutralize the operation upon rest of the masses today when we talk about the third variable the education sector this is more appalling the little children the parents are excited that their kid will go and one day become like baba saab having ambedkar as an inspiration is giving them no option but to send their children to primary school and we all know if you are working in a as a landless laborer if your child is going to school that one helping hand is not there with you who could have made at least 10 15 rupees of the whole day's labor yet dalit children dalit parents are sending sacrificing that 10 15 rupees of whatever they have and sending their children to schools 88 percentage of scheduled caste enrollment is there in primary schools 88 as they go to what we call higher uh, or secondary medium their percentage declines to 66 percentage and then when we go to the higher education what we call colleges or diplomas they are merely 11 percentage and how many of them pass out less than 5 percentage less than 5 percentage dalit graduates this country is producing and we all know what's happening there 88 to less than 5 percentage where are these kids where are these educated where are this indian youth who should have been part into the make the project of nation building the vicious casteist brahminical regime is making sure that they don't access the same amount of education so there is a denigration to their status they are called down as inferior they are called down as meritless people they are told repeatedly that you are here not because of your worth not because of your interest not because of your encouraging enthusiasm to learn something more you are here merely because you were beneficiary of reservation you have no worth in the society you as a equal citizen a citizen is someone who participates in a democracy as an equal citizen here an unequal citizenship is prioritized an unequal citizenship of dalits is hold as a premium because dalits are yet not full indians for this castes bigots dalits have to constantly prove their nationalism every second day 
If I am protesting, I have to make sure I say repeatedly that India is my country. Because the tag of anti-national is slapped on my face since I am born. 41% of the Indian Dalits are lost in prison. It is no accident. And if you look at Muslims as well as Adivasis, it covers the whole spectrum. Being a Dalit is being a criminal in society. And to escape the criminality heaped upon you, you have to constantly dance and negotiate your status as fellow citizen. Of this 5% Dalit graduates, very few make it into the profession that they so desperately want. The system is not there to assimilate. The system exists there to exclude. And how do they do that? If you go to workplace, if you try to talk to your colleagues on equal plane, there are castes, taunts and remarks passed upon you. They don't acknowledge your presence as equal. They don't celebrate your festivals. They don't talk good about your ancestors. They don't praise Ambedkar. They always make sure you are the worthless shit that you have come from. And this recognition is given to you by every other blind signifiers that you are operating in as a colleague or otherwise in the society. And so what does a Dalit do? A Dalit has two options. Assimilate on their rules or die. The Delhi suicide rates is at an alarming rate. Because you cannot cope up the subordinate humiliating position. But the Dalits who chose the other option where I will go and I will try to convince these people or what I will do is I will make sure that my identity will never come in front of whatever I am saying. So a casteist bigot will always use his or her religion to parade his or her supremacy where a Dalit even if he is a fellow colleague, a fellow, fellow equal citizen of that society, of that campus or of that workplace has to inherently adopt and aspire for his secondary position. If you claim your equal citizenship, the entire workplace gangs up against you. That's what happened with in IIT uh, Kanpur. A professor Rohit Sardela. He was a graduate of IIT Kanpur himself, a PhD holder himself. Goes and gets into the work, a workplace, gets a faculty position, but his castist colleagues challenge him by saying that this guy who is our colleague now doesn't have merit and how he has his thesis plagiarized. The same institution that granted him PhD one year ago, actually his colleagues now come back after him to say that your thesis is a plagiarized. Instead of engaging in that conversation as to how much this has happened, this goes to the board. That's how caste system operates. It doesn't end up on a lower level. The highest authority takes in. And they want to make sure that they investigate this cause. Professor Sardela is, undergone, is undergoing uh, uh, torments for more than a year. A young child, his wife, is tra his wife, who is again intercaste marriage, is undergoing a lot of pressures. Now, a fellow faculty who has passed from the same institution is not willing to acknowledge his merit. How much of a vicious casteism can it exist where you are not trusting your own children? And that's why the Dalit blood is most feared blood. The concept of love marriage. They don't want Dalits to be mixing their blood with your daughters or with your sons because they know your blood is an impure, filthy blood, full of malaise of generations and generations of caste. Dalit is a blood that will have the potential to purify your wretched and tormented souls. It is the sadism that one is not willing to accept the rational humanity of other Dalits that an inter-caste marriage becomes a moment of a contentious violence and pogroms in the entire district. Today, wherever we uh, aspire or wherever we cast our, uh, um, our, 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 our gaze, one thing that comes out is this society is making sure that Dalits remain 
inferior in their mind and in their action if they see a dalit who is asserting himself who is calling out his ancestors and believing in his own history is the most unacceptable dalit for the society whereas a buddhu brahmin becomes accepted as a revered priest we have a saying if you are a failed brahmin you can become a revered priest in a big temple but even if you are a successful dalit you will still be a failed brahmin the narratives of violence keep on changing violence remain the common factor every day three dalit women are raped every day two dalits die every week five dalit houses are burnt this is the gory statistics that this regime has produced and any political dispensation has not had the courage to deal with it up front the autonomous dalit voices who want to come and fight on their own are treated and told as the the corrupted people of the society best example is of course often accused to mayawati you talk about mayawati the second thing people tell you in response is oh a corrupt politician not even allowing us to express our full sentiments and emotions about this figure even before we own our own kinds they want you to disown your own kinds and by doing that what they do is they create divisions in the forging unity of dalits wherever the caste of uh, brahmin or brahminism has gone they have made sure that the idea of merit and meritocracy retains and that has happened across the board and even in these societies uh, wherever we see especially in america where they become the proponents of the uh, filthy logic of of meritocracy when we talk about the issue of caste caste relies on two things among many other things but two things one is the concept of purity or pollution and second is the material the concept of purity and pollution animates through various cultural agencies religion becomes one of the primary factors that tells you how to treat other person if a religion treats and teaches you to discriminate other religion this religion is actually deserving to be died for so long it continues to remain alive and i think that's the failure of modern civilization which still continues to tolerate such wretched system operating as a religion in our society the second question of land land is a central aspect in granting the aggressive status to anybody the jats for example the shudras they were shudras lower caste people had a lower status in the society after getting an access to a religion that granted them equal access because of the access and ownership of land become the next brahmins of a sikh society similar happens with other shudra communities of india go marathas or any other communities across the board they become the neo brahmins neo kshatriyas and neo banias of our society the aspirants they are always in the waiting to be the next lack of human dignity is among these people who don't see themselves as equal citizens but always want to make sure you are superior because if you establish your superiority you make sure someone is lower to you and if you want someone lower to you you want a slave slavery in proper action with legal codes authorized by religion caste has retained its order across religion the attacks that we see in muslims against muslims are against the lower caste muslims of that society it is not the elite muslims who are operating or amas who have been always on the monarchical or the higher pedestal of society who are facing the wrath of society no it is the poor converted dalit or lower caste muslims who going to islam to find a refuge these are the people who are getting attacked 
and why are they getting attacked because the brahminical regime wants untouchables under their order how dare you leave us and went to islam that's the beef that is operating and similar instances we see happening against christians when they say there is an attack against christians it's a very misnormal it's a euphemistic at its worst 80% of indian christian are dalits so when you say it is an against attack against christians who are you talking about you are talking about the dalit converts who are christians but by not mentioning that you make sure brahminical order retains and how do you retain brahminical order in a civil society regime you talk over issues like secularism you talk over issues like communalism you talk over issues like classism you talk over issues like regionalism yet you will not talk about issues that is at the center of this operation which is caste the moment you evade or you liberalize caste you became the perpetrator of worst part of casteism and so it's a signal to all to take into cognizance how caste is animating our discourse only 9% dalits in india own land out of that land you have to categorize into uh, there is a quality land quality 1 quality 2 quality 3 they have a different economic measures or various terminologies that identify with what kind of land you have some land which produces lot of yield and some land which is barren on the barren side of line dalits are the most owners of that kind of land 83 percentage of india's landless laborers are dalits When you talk about landlessness in a feudal society you are talking about perpetual enslavement 83% of the dalits in rural areas are slaves of the land owning castes and if you actually divide into various district wise data seven major districts in india 90% of the dalits are landless all india level data goes to 71 percentage if 70% 71 percentage dalits are landless where do they go they turn out to find new employment and thus they go to urban areas they migrate they migrate trying to find no networks no connections nobody who they know they just show up on a railway station trying to find the next good job or trying to find wherever they can go and survive they have their kids who are growing and these people become the urban beggars of our society the migrant dalits who go to urban areas are the people who are begging on streets add to that now the adivasi population various caste among dalits perform various kinds of jobs the entertainment the circus that we see is belonging to a specific caste of that society indian caste system has made sure dalits remain the beggars of this society and they always want you to be beggars be it a question of reservation or be it a question of economism they want you to be on the receiving end they want you to go and beg but we are now asking to subvert that we don't want to beg we don't even want to petition we tried for 70 years now we want to try something else and we would like to challenge and question the overarching dominance of minority communities of india how the hell a 3 percentage brahmin community owns 50 percentage of india's resources unless we address that question we will not be able to address the question of dalits or adivasis operating on a different spectrum because inequality as i said is is relative but to hide their own privileges brahmins make everyone else hindus because if you make everyone else hindus you will not be able to tell that you are a brahmin sitting on 50 percentage of the wealth this is the crooked strategy that they have deployed 1985 
45 percentage of the wealth was belonging to the billion class 2013 it has become to 65 percentage it's a study by paris school of economics thomas piketty his team had done this research when we see the question of land intertwined with the notion of poverty and as well as caste people will want to engage with question of land through the issue of class and this is a message to the brahmin marxists who try to teach the subalterns about the notion of the imported theories of frankfurt school or the or the global leftism yet their siblings continue to rape us continue to mutilate us continue to enjoy the privileges of their uninherited unworked wealth it is the shudras it is the dalits it is the adivasi who are cultivating who are producing who are contributing into nation's wealth but it is the brahmin run banks brahmin run public sector unions and companies who are actually giving the loans of these hard working people to these thugs of our society who are taking the wealth and showing the middle figure to india and just coughing off and yet we still tend to talk about the notion only of hindutva when we will be talking the idea of caste that operates in making of every hindutva we are unable to loosen our own desires that tend to tell us that the real problem doesn't lie in the acrobatics of religion versus religion it was never a problem religion in india is not a significant problem if you add caste to that it becomes a problem and therefore within the sikh society you see divisions happening according to various ramgadias or the ravidasis and various societies because it is the aspiration of the subaltern to be claiming his equality every religion in india is not offering that equality because of the lack of egalitarian ethos how will you have egalitarian ethos when your ancestors have told you to enjoy someone else's hard work your ancestors have tutored you to go somebody else's works loot that and enjoy your life that's what caste system has done to the upper caste sensibilities of this country the idea of hard work doesn't exist exploiting someone else's wealth depends on this mechanics of the caste system when we talk about the financial assets what are the financial assets that belong to the dalit community because there is oft repeated instances that dalits are now well off you must be hearing the defenses from this kind of people who constantly tell that dalits are now well done now they don't need reservation they don't need any kind of resources in this society because you know what they are now self satisfied look at that dalit they will show you two figures me and someone else and say dalits don't need reservation they have made it here dalits only own 9 percentage of the whole financial assets of the country only 9 that is an alarming figure dalits are 18 percentage of india's population and when it comes to owning of financial assets and we are talking about assets the savarna the, the 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 brahmins the kshatriya as well as the baniya community which is close to 21 percentage of the population owns 48 percentage of the country's financial assets and then if you talk about the there is also in india there is a funny you know when they talk about financial assets they also count gold how much of a gold is on because gold we all know is a, is 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 a strong solid currency in all these dialogues religious institutions get a green flag they don't tend to be accounted in all of this madness how many temples in india how many gurudwaras in india how many mosques in india how many viharas in india are sitting on the wealth that should be distributed to society for the most poorest and most needed 
does any religious institution take it upon themselves that every year we will have this much of a turnover and whatever money will come because Mahatma Phule himself told this is the money of the poor working class people, the farmers, the peasants who work hard and bring the money into the temple just because they have the belief in the system and once the Brahmin who works nothing and he uses the word the pot-bellied Brahmin uses the wealth of working class people to feed his own kinds. This debate doesn't occur into progressive minds. Instead, the charitable instincts take place. Where they say, we build a hospital for you. We build schools for you. And yet we will charge fees for you. Privatization of every other sector has taken. Temple is the first privatized sector that has happened way before any other privatization in this country. So when we talk about privatization, why not also pay attention to the religious organization as well as social religious groups who are actually funding such kind of activities for them to perpetuate caste-based discriminations or any kinds of fascist violence that we have in the society. Privatization of education. Privatization of airports. You all know that now privatization of railway stations. Everything when it is privatized, it is actually Brahminized. It is to the Brahmins and Banias that this wealth is given. So in India, the idea of privatization works very well because the people who should question this are the people themselves who are fighting against it. It's a very critical space. The Brahmins here and Brahmins there. The dominant caste here and dominant caste there. Right and left. Whereas the people who are on the larger spectrum, the lower caste or the so-called subaltern groups, they don't even form the part of conversation that is taking place on a higher level. So one might go to World Social Forum and talk about the social movement activities and yet there will be another conservative sitting in some temple or sitting in some religious organization or some heading some right-wing group across wherever part of the world they are, yet they will talk about the same thesis. Language is different, but the premise is the same. Observe it very closely. That's why I call upon the Brahmins to be the cultural suicide bombers of this society. You can't just be the participant, you can't just be the supporters, you can't just be the people who are in solidarity. You got to be the cultural suicide bomber and unless and until you do that, you are the more perpetrator of casteism upon us as much as the people who is committing crimes and rapes upon us. There is no difference between you and the others. The people need to take the mantle. They cannot offer us symbolic as well as vocabularies that could help us satisfy our healing moment for those uh, temporary times. We need a long term solutions. As and when we talk about caste becoming an issue, people always make sure caste doesn't become an issue. You talk to any liberal, any radical, any progressive and talk to on their face, do this test. Hey, what do you think about caste? Just ask this, of all the things. Hear the response. Document it. Look at critically how they will evade it. Even in their acknowledgement, they will evade it. Now you know it's a problem. Uh, but it's changing. Changing for who? You, your siblings, who made it here in Canada or in America, or who are actually having the ownership of major companies in India? No, no, no. You know, they had a, a Dalit chief minister. When? 10 years ago? And when we are talking about her, you are telling her she's corrupt in the second breath. Oh, no, you know what? Caste was a thing of the past. Now it doesn't operate in a similar way. Now it has changed. What does that mean? Has that changed the life of Dalits or the Adivasis operating on a receiving end? Has it made a change to the three Dalit women? They are still raped every day in the society. And the people who stand defensive to the caste are the people who are participating in the rapes of Dalit women that are happening in this country. Until and unless this becomes part of our everyday dialogue. Caste is a footnote to every other problem that we have in India. Caste should be the primary introductory intervention in whatever we do in India. You will talk about issues affecting Kashmiris. You will talk about the issues affecting Muslims. You will talk about the issues affecting Sikhs. You will talk about the issues affecting Dalits. Then Adivasis. Then, because it has become almost like a, a carnival of these many solidarity movements. Why not talk about Dalit issues as you talk about Kashmir issues? Why not talk about Dalit issues as you talk about the issues affecting Muslims or Sikhs or other castes or other 
groups in India. Whatever problems we have that affects health, that affects every other sector of Indian society, caste plays a primary role and we need to apply the anti-caste lens to understand the sensitivity of this issue. And right now, we have Brahminical lens and through that, we tend to theorize the problems of India society and if you are using the Brahminical lens to theorize the problem of society, you will provide answers that are temporary for that moment only, that will not be a structural time change. It will be a feel-good conversation, it will be like a therapy con uh, discussion of one hour. You step out of it, miseries will fall down back upon you because the structures have not been shaken. There are two theories that constantly keep on telling uh, the prevalence and persistence of caste. One is the violence and second is the defense. Violence against the caste bodies and it is defense of the privileged caste bodies. People today who are enjoying the benefits of caste system present themselves as the victims of this caste system. How ironic of this. You will see many dominant caste kids crying and lamenting that because of reservation they couldn't get the seats in some specific institution. That means they are afraid of less than 5% Dalit graduates who barely make it to the university and they put their entire blame on Dalits. So Dalits still have to bear the brunt of a failed Brahmin on their own shoulders. If you are not smart enough, it is not up to the Dalits that you have to blame. It is up to the Brahmins who are taking your seats, you should blame. This conversation doesn't become part of our own thinking too. People come with a jaundiced mind to talk about caste. Caste should become a primary nexus of all the meeting points in India. Because even before every other religion that existed in India, caste still was there and caste still is here. One of the reasons why do we have eight different goddamn religions in India? Why do we need so many religions in India? And bearing we have very much regional religions also. You have in Karnataka the Basava religion, you can go to Maharashtra, there is another saint religion. We have various religions. Why do we need so many religions? Because caste had made sure that it will penetrate into every other religion that promised an escape from it. Be it Sikhism, be it Islam, Parsis and every other societies that we have in India. Unless and until we address this issue in our current generation, our forthcoming generations will again fear that they have, will have to face a huge snowball effect of this caste. And you know, the people who belong to the dominant caste, it is upon, excuse me, it is upon there, where they need to take the responsibility of dismantling it. Because your existence in a society and not being active and sensitive about caste means you are participating into a caste. And this problem is going to continue for the next generation. Many parents tell me, I did not bring up my child with any caste based sensibilities. And so what? Did caste go away just by like that? By you not telling them? They will go to colleges, they will go to universities, they will meet other caste people where this conversation is bound to come and then what? You have not prepared your child. They are going to blame you for the rest of your life for not equipping them to face this wrath. So person belong to any caste. And I recall the progressive Brahmins who were part of Fule's and Ambedkar's movement who took upon fellow Brahmins to fight against the scourge of caste. They said, this system is wrong, we are going to fight against our own siblings. And people ask me, where should I begin my caste fight? It begins in your house with your mother and father, your sister and brother and families. You have to be courageous enough to fight against them. If you are not willing to fight against them, then your fight against caste merely becomes a sentimental rhetoric. Where you will come, have two, three samosas in our normal conversations and go back home. Go back to your again, enjoying your privileges of that. You should not be resting unless each person who is on the lowest order is liberated. And many people today talk about the notion of capitalism that is operating in our society. They say capitalism is going to liberate the people. If you look at the uh, representation of self-employment among Dalits, even though Dalits, they are skillful, they are having craft, they can go and they are versatile people, they can work in various vocations if they are put into. 
yet the self employment rate is less than 20 percentage they don't get capital they don't get support to start the business even if they start there is no network that is going to help to run the business and for god forbid if the person knows if the society comes to know that this business belongs to a dalit you will face negative loss not just loss negative loss and that is been the experiences across the board and so when we are act, when we are talking about this sorry i, I said less than 20 as less than 40 per 37 percentage of the less are self employed when we talk about the wage laborers there are two categories one is wage laborer dalits constitute the highest number of wage laborers because they have nowhere else to go and wage labor you know is a job which is relying on everyday job if you get a job you are happy if you don't then you go home wage labor is the most sensitive this is what the neoliberal capitalism has managed to do it created contractorship and the contractor made sure that you work more hours and you will get same money going back to the industrial era this was already done in india neoliberalism did not have to teach us we were already contractualizing this we already in our own farms we already had a what we call various languages uh, a, a person who was controlling his 90 30 40 50 number of peasants the land owner was always away was not there in direct contact there was a middle man who would exploit there were various names jagirdar or whatever names they had they would fight with them they would get the wealth and the money would go we have been practicing this for so long so don't don't teach us about contractual relationship any indian casteist uh, jat or uh, maratha or this land owning caste will tell us we have been so we have we have we have gotten an excellent degree in practicing exploitation of others labor we are just waiting for the person to produce a surplus the day or the moment they produce surplus you will ensure that surplus is not only taken but the quality and dignity of that labor is denigrated because if you deny the agency of that labor you will successfully keep the labor hanging and the labor will not protest the labor will not participate because he or she will still continue to believe that this system has made sure that i am not a person with qualities i am a person who is just here because someone else is more greater than me i will just do my job and what is your job just go from one conveyor belt to the other belt don't aspire for the bigger and that is what happened a talented dalit will still be confined to his inferiorities what has been given by brahmini religion even though you have a degree you have the quality you have the experience you are constantly told don't aspire to be the next top guy in the business chain you still be the secondary as a closing point i would like you to reflect on this various issues that are facing in our front caste caste issue is also very much relevant to canada as much as it is relevant to every other society that indian has migrated but also non indian societies have the caste problems caste is not unique only to the hindu regime or the various indo centric religion regime caste in its various forms has operated in various societies that doesn't give the hindus a free pass to say see we are not the only one who has practiced discrimination they will feel good because we have people with a, with a very shallow minds caste is a global struggle more than 300 million people face the wrath of caste and untouchability one america equivalent of an entire mass is undergoing this humiliating treatment and if we live to this humiliations rapes murders pillages of this society we are committing the same crimes by remaining absent from that active conversations and collaboration so wherever south asia studies or whichever studies discipline or whichever organization they are we should try to make a conversation frank conversation about how caste is interpreting the discourses how much of dalit or adivasi students constitute in the indian student intakes in ubc in montreal in mcgill or harvard we are doing at harvard now because this is the question that will clear the air that people have been gasping because they use the post colonial lens to tell us you know what the white man and white women were problem only or you were also complicit in that 
they will not talk about their own ancestors being complicit in, uh, in, in, in stretch of the British colonial or any other regime. And every society that is post-colonial, quote-unquote, had their own Brahmins of society as well as their own Dalits. The Brahmins of society used and sold the Dalits of their rich society, be it Africa or be it Latin America. The lower caste or the subaltern caste continued to suffer the brunt. When the colonial armies or colonial regime went, these people were still living in safe, safe and secure places. The condition of Dalits, what Ambedkar said, that the masters, the colonial masters will go, but the native masters will still be there we will still remain the slaves of this society and we cannot afford to leave the society. At least in my lifetime, I will make sure that not only my slavery, but the slavery of other oppressed people across the world is created when we will talk to each other on a terms of our experiences. And I really hope the Ambedkar group here makes contact with the oppressed population here in this country and try to educate each other, try to learn from each other and try to see about the survival tactics. How did they fought and how can we create a cohesive world for all until unless we make the aggressor on defensive. We have to put the person who is committing crime upon us defensive in the first instance rather being defensive on ourselves at the first because when we become defensive we become responsible for whatever actions we do now it is about time we turn the order like marx turned hegel up and upside down france were not turned marx upside down ambedkar turned all of them upside down and brought to us a new phenomena through the language of buddhism talking about egalitarian ethos that transcended every other boundaries gave that nectar that was more radical, that was not meditative only. Ambedkar's Buddha is a social revolutionary who is walking, who is spreading the message and who is actually challenging the intellectual Brahmins to fight intellectually how much can you deal and how much can you talk about the egalitarianism and the absence thereof. And therefore, when we talk about Baba Sahib Ambedkar or the various varieties of thoughts that he has put forward, we have to be also cognizant about the internal contradictions that appear within forging Dalit as well as other caste solidarities. It has to be not a purposeful solidarity, but it has to be an organic solidarity with a devoted and committed purpose that I love you as a fellow citizen of whatever country you are or whatever humanity you belong to. The struggle of Dalits need not be only hetero-patriarchal struggle. It has to transcend the sexualities. We have to take the LGBTQ community, the trans people to be part of the struggle. And until unless this broad-based alliance become part of informing a caste-based solidarity, Dalit lives will not continue to matter. And therefore, when we talk about Dalit lives matter, it has to be not only Dalits, but every other oppressed life that has been oppressed across various regions and across various reasons. But yes, the scourge of Dalits has been on the brunt. They have carrying all of these burdens for so long. So when Dalits speak, they will speak for themselves, but also they will make sure other voices are represented in their echoes. And when time comes, they will set, set step aside and give chances for all other marginalized groups in forging a common unity against this wretched regime. Thank you. My name is Anne Murphy. I'm the director of CESAR, the Center for Indian South Asia Research. So I'm here to moderate the questions. So, um, so I am Aman. So I am quite interested on in how you kind of deconstructed uh, the entire like situation. So I have like three variables in my mind, which is colonization, capitalism, and in the recent elections, you see this um, mobilization or reemergence of a uh, forward caste vote bank. Yeah. So how do you treat the interaction of these three variables going forward? Because it's quite critical, or quite, quite like against the grain of what you're trying to achieve or articulate. I, okay. Um, should I, want to respond to that? Okay, I can respond, I'll... yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you, what's your name, sorry? No, what's your name? Aman. Aman, thank you. I mean, you know, uh, and that's, I think, we need to, uh, I mean, that's what I was trying to also break uh, as to how these three regimes have, you know. Actually, they have used various lenses, uh, depending upon situation, just to adjust. So when you talk about caste, you know, uh, the capitalist kind of fragmentations or superstructure takes place. Or if you talk about capitalism, you know, the other regional kind of mobilization. And I think this has to do with, you know, people have tried to find uh, uh, excuses to, uh, thank you excuses to grant a certain legitimacy 
to let's say see i think and i believe in what you know actually uh, ambedkar's plan was which was through republican party of india and of course his labor party as well as uh, scheduled caste federation which was not actually a caste party it was anti caste party but the congress and other regimes learned from ambedkar's effort and supported that to make their own ideas into casteist party because i think that was one of the successes of congress and now we see the failure coming out and congress and and bjp both are you know ambedkar would say left and right hand side of the each of the same body and to add to that i will add the left party also is the third hand if there is one because they will still um for example the forward caste or the non brahmin caste who continue to you know frame and i think that is their miseducation and under education especially the shudras or the you know uh, 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 because they they were targeted they were given land during colonial times these caste were given land after colonial times congress strengthened them more by because the primary fear for congress or any other caste regime was the rise of ambedkar consciousness among all the masses and when it's an ambedkar consciousness it is actually trying to challenge the structure whichever they are living in so what they did was so that the uh, untouchable consciousness remain uh, in control they made sure the local landlords or the local dominant caste people because in every village there is specific caste which is dominating they granted them lands uh, enormously and after granting them lands in short time they politicized them they brought them into political uh, equations and that's why we see today many regional parties uh, you know first while it was congress's hegemony but right now in every uh, region in every uh, landlord castes or you know the land owning caste belong to congress or any other parties so if you have to if you have to refute that one of the things we have to tell the forward caste is that they are still dependent they are not independent by controlling untouchable doesn't mean you are <laughs> you are superior you are still lower you don't have access to wealth because that's why we have reservation arguments that are people are like juts uh, as well as the people in uh, uh, patels in gujarat and marathas and you know it's going to go because they don't see them in the positions but also second thing is they see more dalits in the positions that's the jealousy that's the insecurity to see how come the how the hell does dalit from this village is now becoming an officer in certain you know so they see this equations playing very well and they don't want it to work in you know because for them development of dalit goes against their own development because if you don't have untouchables why why do we need india india needs untouchables to survive the day india untouchables will cease who will be the next untouchable just jats or the dominant caste will say we don't want to be and that's why there is this kind of constant strength and struggle of each caste to strengthen its own uh, uh, purchase has become a problem in the capitalist regime when we talk about this there has not been any significant change among the forward castes we just have to look at the statistics in the obcs you know they are one of the uh, you know one of the first performing groups but what happens is among the obcs there is an upper obc who is always playing the card of obc but letting other because obc has more than 3500 castes the backward classes people and the backward classes people are having constant struggle with the dominant you know regime and i think that is where we need to break and that is where we need to you know create a a, a kind of a um, osmosis of the lower caste groups and i think kanchiram did it very well after ambedkar it was only kanchiram who could bring this formula into action where he said you know we are 85 percentage and we will need 85 percentage of the share period don't talk to me more you know jitni sankhya jiski jitni sankhya bhari uski utni bhagidari aur hissedari whatever you call and i think that was a very classic plan and that gave many people a critical caste consciousness people started questioning this hegemony and dominance and even today the people who are the forward caste or the shudras equivalent they know that they are lower but they are happy that dalits are still lower than them but now what happens is in the one generation dalits are actually progressing compared to them and now they cannot see this and now they are trying to find various reasons to put down dalits and that's what they were one of the active participants in making sure the protection uh, against the atrocities act uh, the poa act the scst act they made sure that this was loosened 
so that you know more crimes could be committed and i think it's a it's 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 it's, it's a space where we need to think how do we get the all the oppressed groups in the society in one conversation because again i told and i made this statement i said even brahmins are oppressed by dominant caste brahmins but that brahmin will not see his pain like the shudra will not see his pain as equivalent but you are suffering you cannot marry who you want to marry and there is a still a problem and i think we need to educate this under educated people who are just you know wondering about like a headless chicken around and trying to provide their own new agency without them having any agency um hi thank you for your talk that was absolutely amazing thank you. um i'm vijiha i'm a phd student here okay. um throughout your talk i could sense um uh, this desire around like national belonging kept talking about national and uh, nation building um how we should love each other as citizens um and yet you also talked about how the only place that is given to marginalized in the nation is that of exile uh and as as you said that i was immediately thinking about also hana arend as she talks about the jewish question that was addressed and she talks about how the only place that is given to the marginalized is that of exile or forcible assimilation that's what you said so mm -hmm. do you think there's a need to deconstruct the very idea of Beautiful. nation and nationalism Beautiful. yes we'll so take one more sure. and we'll move on to the next Hi uh thanks for your talk uh, I'm my name is Sujata my question is about how do you see in your scheme of things the movement that happened in let's say Tamil Nadu mm -hmm. where you know the Periyar uh, Ramaswamy EBR movement which actually I mean the indicators I believe are very good in Tamil Nadu yes and uh, Tamil Nadu is one of the states where you know reservation you can argue yeah. that reservation has achieved its end in the sense that the people who occupy the positions don't come out of reservations that's right so how do you see that that's right you mean the reservations are continue to be used by the same no no uh -huh. i mean that people who occupy positions uh -huh. are from the lower sections that's right for which all these for whom all these would have been denied but for made it in their own right that's right That's right. They would be from the lower sections of society. Okay. So how do we place? So, uh, Nijita, thank you for that question. You know, and and, and you know, the uh, it is very important if we look at the idea of nation construction and na and nation building through the lens or experiences rather of Dalits. Where do they fit? Do does nation exist for them? and if it does how it is formed is it a geographical entity or benedi anderson say is it imagine entity or is it actually historical entity you know and i think for dalits it's a it's a historical construction they, they because that's what belongs to them the contemporary times might not be uh, sympathetic to them but historically that has how it has been manifested right and that's why we talk about the great the the dalits being you know the original inhabitants of harappa civilization right and we created this innovations and then aryas the brahmins and the dominant caste came and you know gave their caste codes to us when nation um, is debated in indian context dalits have very interestingly i mean all the dalit panthers were saying how about dalit stan you know let us think about a possibility of our own country and you know um, but again i think because of lack of international support and lack of internationalism that has happened uh, there is not much of a purchase to that idea but ambedkar talked about separate settlement it's a very interesting logic nation within nation well, he said because dalits are minorities in every villages and because the people who are dominant they have more numbers they will easily oppress how about we do this get the dalits and get their own separate settlement so they are majority if you want to fight let they be equal numbers the castes are cowards they come in mobs to beat one dalit or one family and these cowards kind of par uh, parade their you know uh, zealot nationalism because they equate nationalism with this and therefore the nationalism in india right now is a brahmin or what i call manu centered nationalism you know and there is no uh, you know i mean i'm, I'm actually uh, trying to write one piece on this i was thinking that the democracy that exists in india is actually uh, not part of the nation building because when you are building a nation uh, you don't need democracy to operate you need a certain kind of 
डेमोक्रेटिक ऑटोक्रेसी मीनिंग यू नीड पीपल हु विल जस्ट ब्लाइंडली फॉलो एंड नॉट पार्टिसिपेट इन टू डेमोक्रेटिक एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ राइट एंड हाउ डज दिस हैपन यू मेक द इश्यू ऑफ काउ or you make various issues of lynching against muslims or you make various issues against this what happens is this mobs becomes a democratic participant of autocracy it is not actually participating in change for certain goods it is just becoming a peddler but yet they are democratic citizens yet they are exercising democracy whatever right it may belong to and so people have confused this because they immediately said this is a fascist regime how do you mention it a fascist regime without accounting to this democratic participation there is a very serious theoretical confusion that many people have and for dalit the 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 nation or whatever nation means is not uh, actually the nation for example they imagine the nation of you know ashoka's time it's not the expanse it's about the quality of life i think that's very important and that's why nation is very central to whatever you do because politically you are relevant if you are not political subject then you become nobody and for dalits it's very important that they re- remain politically uh, active that's why you see they are protesting and all the day dalits will lose the hopes in political democracy india will crumble into pieces we will have civil wars we will have repeated civil war we will not stop but they have still hold on and what i call it is because of dalit love dalits have not given the capacity to love the day they will stop loving other human beings they will start taking arms and you know why are they not doing it it's not because of their uh, 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 they are uh, cowards or something they are still believing in the promises but that should not come as a permission for the oppressor to oppress them it's a slow warning they should take that into mind because one day or the other this is going to change and that's why we are trying to believe we are trying to propagate the message of creating harmony amongst us this is an this is gone up up to on the shoulders of dalits that we are actually telling them let this not happen to you we are anyway dying and we are making sure that dignity is remained there but the day it will go above us we'll make sure that you know you will also come with us in the graveyard and it has to be a fight of equality in death as well as in life but this constant uh, educational as well as cultural political e- uh, engagements that are happening on various level it is to give a chance and actually the country and whoever believes in this a uh, democracy whatever should be grateful to dalits and should thank every day for making sure that they are not going to the state uh, extent which they should have gone by now 3000 year plus or 2005 year plus still remain the slaves of the society and yet trying to have a dialogue and i think that's the beauty of a dalit existence i call dalit being being a dalit is to not only challenge the status quo but also making sure the next day will be of not only for themselves but for everyone else it is a participation or else they would have asked for a separate nation long ago but they are still hoping into these values and if you are pushing humanity to the last extent i think it is going to be a, a very difficult context so i think to answer your question uh, you know uh, i have to give this background is that nation um, is yet a, a very complicated philosophy you know because nation just just makes two things very critical one is citizenship which is belonging and and two is non belonging basically so dalits are already not belonging and dalits already don't have citizenship and yet the national focus remains and i think this is where we need to you know uh, diversify uh, and i think one needs to really look through for well, ambedkar writes about nationalism very extensively and he says i don't have motherland i mean I, gandhi he says to gandhi Gandhi is like you know you are a great nationalist or he says okay thank you but i don't have a motherland what are you talking about i am disenfranchised in this country i don't have right to vote you have given right to six you have given right to muslims and you take right they given to me so that's the debate where gandhi is constantly trying to make sure untouchables are part of his project the day untouchables will give up gandhi will go where Gandhi will show tokenism by employing or having one or two Balmiki or Dalits cleaning the toilets in his ashram, but he can't have entire Dalit population into this. And I think that's the success of Ambedkar that made sure that his promises were kept. In return, did they keep their promise? Is a question of debate. They have not. You know, I'll just give you a brief example 
on the on the reservation you know if i understood you correctly one of the things i see a failure of pariyar politics in tamil nadu is one of first of all you know he was dead against the whole religious dogmatism yet in chennai or any other place every second corner there is temple and there is still hegemony of unquestioned you know how 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 do i how do i channel this dialogue especially in the pariyar's land now pariyar becomes an excuse for any other oppressive you know and it's easy for the dominant caste to appropriate pariyar but pariyar cannot be appropriated because he is then again telling on your face what is it you know the way it has to be told and i think that's why what they did was they created this other non uh, uh, non dominant caste obc politics right wing the rss and the bjp has done very effectively they strengthen this you know and that that's how they have done in dalits as well as that i think it is about time we also go to brahmins and create their own sub caste politics because there are 550 sub castes among brahmin groups yet we never know about them there is a huge fight amongst them why don't we pay attention to that part and i think it is upon the failure because they are making us uh, engaged totally in a different project altogether and to answer your question you know um see one of the things with with reservation is that it has becoming i have told anyway it has become a neutralizing factor to many other operations it is a good scheme and it is necessary but what the oppressor has done is it he has used it as an excuse <laughs> to make sure that they continue to repeat the crimes and atrocities about the communities who are not part of this now if you have to be a reservation holder you need to be a person who has degree for example or you know whatever kind of qualifications we name or you know whatever level we may call the people who are unable to even access that the 95% of the population which is you know i think that's the main concern here so for me if i have to talk about the dalit rights i will rather talk about you know land you know i will talk about education where privatization is not there universal education i will talk about the healthcare which is equal access to healthcare and again and i will also make sure that the temples remain accounted almost every month and their wealth you know continues to be redistributed and i will try to subtract the agency and hegemony of brahmins in every other sectors by you know by bringing more diversity into that into that chain and let's see how it works Mm-hmm. And do you see that as an appropriation of the Dalit identity? Because there are many Dalits who are getting into the stream, and uh, you know, Dalits are actually priests also. Various subcast have their own subcast priests. But these are, you know, in temples where the Dalits would not have been allowed entry. Okay, okay. So this is number two. Yeah. My name is Sanjeev. Um, thanks for this talk. Um, So you spoke a lot about Dalit Dalit experience. So I'm wondering um, if you could lay out um, your arguments about an ethical project to confront uh, various systems of oppression, including casteism, neoliberal capitalism, um, religious fundamentalism, based on situated knowledge drawn upon um, Dalit cult- collectives across the world. Mm. So that's my first question. The second question you have answered. as as uh, partially as a response to the first question so i'm very act- uh, fascinated and curious about your concept of dalit love um so could you lay out the tenets of dalit love um, as a, as an ethical project to confront or to say forge empathy global solidarity and and some sort of a radical uh, humanism or mm-hmm. humanitarianism mm-hmm. yeah yeah you can take yeah that yeah <laughs> sure Hi Suraj, I'm Sasha. Hi. Hi Sasha. Thank you so much for this compelling call to action. Um you briefly alluded to sort of the gendered components of thinking about anti-caste frameworks. Uh first was through uh your conversation about marriage and endogamy and second is um the kind of way that you critique this idea of the carnival of coalition in which kind of caste becomes this tokenist um way in which we approach solidarity. Um and so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the history of sex sexuality and um kind of the ways that uh the dalit world has become this masculine space um so where do women kind of figure in the conversation around anti-casteism and then also sort of um and bethgar is seen as this uh, 
a feminist thinker and sort of sort of how do we read the the, the new framework that you are calling for through a language of feminism? Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I'll go with <clears throat> the order. And you know, uh, this is actually uh, one of the. Uh, I think it's uh, it is where the Dalit community needs to acknowledge their own shortcomings, uh, where the uh, the uh, de-Brahmanization begins also first by you know uh, attacking the gender uh, dominance that exists you know and so when people are saying you have to fight against caste what are you fighting against one of the thing primary is fighting against the sexist norms that operate in society because that's where caste finds its legitimacy and so people across the caste basically when they talk about Dalit rights and all uh, the adequate Dalit women agency is not very much present but that doesn't mean Dalit women are absent you know, Dalit women are very formidable and strong and they are there, you know, they are very radical and they will put person like me or anyone else into the place. And so, thank you. And so, where, where do I, where do I, um, or how do I approach this topic, you know, especially through the sexuality lenses, right? Um, the, it's, 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 it goes two ways. First is the, uh, 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 the kind of what Ambedkar also picked up from Gabriel Tart, the idea of imitation. You, you try to imitate from the dominance amongst you. So you want to be like the next person who is dominating. Because that's the only world you know. And I think this is because of lack of world experiences. Right? Lack of, you know, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get the Dalits, you know, interact with the rest of the world. So they know what's happening around the world. Doesn't mean they are cognizant of it, right? The very evidence of having, uh, you know, Dalit women, fiery Dalit women operating in our societies. But that need not be only tokenized form. It needs to be a genuine kind of central leadership. And I think that's Bamsef and BSP tried to do it very effectively, right? One woman at the helm of everything. Thank you, Akhil. And, and, and then uh, challenging the, the discourses of heteronormativity. Because, and it's heteropatriarchal basically, um, where, you know, uh, lack of uh, anti-caste consciousness brings that into you because your immediate struggles are so pertinent and it is where uh, the Dalit community as well as others if you have to give a model of something anti-caste you have to give a model that is not existing in the Brahminic world which is it has to be uh, gender sensitive it has to be uh, you know uh, uh, trans -sens sensitive as well as LGBTIQ sensitive and that doesn't mean only by uh, mere a demonstration of certain figures but actually it has to be a constant struggle so if i want to show that dalit world is doing these things what is different i'm showing from these what is not existing here so this is a patriarchal space this is a highly misogynistic space this is a this is a very crass space so i have to subvert that and this is what has operated and historically especially if you talk about various dalit societies it has been a matriarchal society the moment it hits the hindu uh, thinking or the pantheons of various thinking, it tries to become patriarchal in its nature. But if you go to Tamil Nadu and all other societies, you know, uh, the, the women character features as, as a very, you know, uh, very interesting kind of. And I think the next uh, person, if you have to find out who will take the mantle forward, needs to be a woman from the Dalit community, you know. Uh, and, and so, uh, and doesn't mean it has to only be woman or it has to only be the project of a woman, but we have to understand the nuances that a woman's agency will bring to this. And how do we do that? And I think this has the work has to do with both sides, you know, where there is, has to be sensitization. But what has happened recently in, you know, in various experiences is the idea of gender has become very much uh, like a NGOized notion. And so many as NGOs, for example, have used or have uh, contested uh, the, or, or, or in a good way actually they talked about the importance of gender but at the same time what they did was they were trying to not go through the social movement perspective not understanding how the social movement realities are there on the ground if you talk or if you import through certain experiences of let's say you know uh, NGO based women activism or NGO based certain activism Dalit activism too it really has a very limited goal it talks, only talks about representation it only talks about filling the blanks. And I think that is important, but that is not complete. That will only, you know, help you to uh, make me feel good that, you know, I have one woman on the stage now. 
but that will not you know and i think that has the work of social movements where they subvert the patriarchal order and by doing that not only means getting a woman but also making sure that more and more male uh, uh, cent- uh, uh, patriarchal sensitivities kind of decrease and i think that will only happen when we try to embrace the the wholesome logic of of how you look at this issue uh, <coughs> i mean uh, sanjeev thank you for that question you see one of the uh, um, you know I, i was thinking about this issue how to how to talk about uh, you know this confluences of capitalism and you know uh, uh, the new liberal order and and caste and <coughs> and one has to be uh, self reflexive to answer this question and if we lose the capacity to be self reflective that is a central tenet of the pragmatists you know that is a central tenet of what ambedkar's thinking is it has to be self reflective self reflective only brings through the various conditions that are offered to you to be self reflective now here you are not only uh, you know you are not having the space to be self reflective whatever you are doing you are actually self critical because the society is telling that you are not deserving it or you know you have done something wrong or you have corrupted so instead of being self reflective for the you know for the entire growth you become self critical and that self criticism doesn't remain to yourself it becomes self demonization and one has to draw a very serious line into that and when when you self demonize you become the criminal of the society even though nobody is making you criminal you become part of that and i think it is where the <coughs> the idea of dalit love becomes very important i think people have not embraced fully the nectar of dalit love why are dalits still loving they have no reason to love others give me one good reason why do why should they love a, a other dominant oppressor caste person i mean i can't find i mean you can talk about the ethical moral project of it you know we are all uh, you know human beings and all on what cost on two dead uh, dalit dead bodies every day it cannot be a project so there is something crucial that is happening here and i think the world needs to pay attention to the world's oldest surviving discrimination happening on a such a large scale you know crime against an entire humanity every day taking place at you know the watch of the world media and everything yet dalits remain resilient in their love they are resilient but also their love is not about the romantic cheap market love it is actually destroying the market oriented notions of love it is something else it is beyond the human blood relations it repeatedly tells you it's a spiritual experience it believes you're your ancestral uh, 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 whatever they bequeath about you you know if dalits are loving that means they are still reminiscing they are still living in the thoughts of their ancestors the great people whom about whom we really know nothing about who lived for so long yet their history doesn't uh, become part of the conversation every time they make sure when the dalit is practicing a love and when i say a dalit being equates dalit love being a dalit is to love other person you are still trying to find agency in other person you are still trying to find the human there is a demon in this oppressor but you make sure you are still trying to find that there is a human still and i will make sure that the human capacities of this person will come forward the demon has brought because they have kissed the brahmanical order and i think because of this very thin line and i think you asked very right question about the ethical project of this i think this is a ethical project and within ethic it is not about the ethic of a ruling class which talks about retaining of a status quo but it is actually subverting and that ethic is a very crucial ethic because it is not only radical but it is revolutionary because it is going to change and it has happened you see in one generation dalits could achieve so much if they would be a hating people they would have ended up only hating and not concentrate on doing something more creative more productive more scientific they found various reasons to thrive to survive to grow to nurture as well as love and people take dalit existence for granted they think this they are just surviving no i think they are giving opportunity to the rest of the humanity to survive with them it's a cohabitation space it's not an apartheid 
that's why the whole notion of uh, the idea of nation becomes very crucial in this why one question is why love a dalit because caste system operates on hating a dalit there is only hatred you don't know how the other person is you have not even managed to talk on a human level there is no fraternity what ambedkar has called fraternity friendship there is no companionship as a fellow human being sir let's talk about this you are hating it because you know dalits will still love you the power of dalit love prevails on this and you know why are you hating them because your ancestor did not taught you anything else what else is the other reason that you are hating this vulnerable poor poverty ridden people who don't have anything to do who have not going to oppress you who are not who are not killing you who are merely being your workers but still you hate it's upon your ancestors who did all the atrocities and did not tell you the truth of human values dalits are teaching humanity to rest of the india they are schooling every day even without going to schools and why love a dalit because that's where your insecure self will get a refuge caste system has made us insecure so much so that we don't want to acknowledge the existence of other person as someone who exists we even look past dalits as if they don't exist why love a dalit because dalit will make sure that you are also valued in your own eyes when you are when i am oppressing other person i am actually declaring myself as a monster why what other reason do i have to oppress other person there is a monstrous tendency in me i have killed the human in me thanks to my ancestors but dalits are still retaining that and it's not a romantic conception it is in action it is in everyday reality you see various democratic protests carried out by dalits that is a chance you see even in their refusal to go down to the hegemonic order to the oppressive order when you are refusing you are still loving because when you are refusing you are refusing democratically you are not refusing by blowing up the bridge you are not just refusing by cleaning up the, all the relations you are making sure that this dialogue remains and i think the whatever socratic tradition we had about arguments and debate the lich have been existing and exercising this even without knowing about their own ancestors without even knowing about their own people they still have inherited something very crucial which is not only to teach your own children how to love but also telling them tell people who are saying how not to love how to love we'll end there um so can we thank dr yengde thank you so there are more events happening with dr yengde while he's here in bc Uh, yeah, no. Um, uh, we've been having uh, uh, these events for the last number of years, and again, it's built on some of the uh, concepts uh, Suraj has mentioned. One is about about acknowledging and appreciating the work that is happening, regardless of who or what community the person is from. Right? It's to br- it's to build those bridges, reach out to diverse movements. So we have four categories, and we're going to be recognizing change. What we're calling change champions. and and we would like to extend our invitation to all of you to to join us and then uh, also i would like to uh, 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 share my appreciation and acknowledgement to uh, brother suraj for coming uh, here and having this uh, wonderful and uh, lively presentation uh, presentation and great questions you know i i i must say this this has been really encouraging uh, to me one also acknowledge uh, uh, dr murphy and dr schneiderman and and others from ubc for uh, partnering with us you know as well as with uh, 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 smear ganesha dr smear ganesha who has played a, a critical role from uh, simon fraser university and this year we have a new partnership uh, with uh, quantum uh, polytechnic uni- uh, university and one i want to really uh, 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 say thanks brother sir you mentioned that that uh, that that uh, in terms of creating and strengthening matriarchal relationships and the need for for the dalit organizations to to uh, to give the space to to women 
right? And, and I just want to acknowledge uh, Anita uh, uh, for, for, for teaching us the value of, of what you have just said. Beautiful. Because the forum, the idea of creating a forum rather than a, a lecture, it was, uh, it was her idea. Beautiful. And give a round of applause. And the reason I wanted to say that is, uh, you know, when you look at the um, Facebook comments and posting, about 90% of the responses are from women, Beautiful. right? And 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 uh, uh, it, 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 she's been able to reach out to the younger population. We talk about caste. We talk about how we believe youngsters are being impacted, but we were not able to reach out to them. And it's uh, by 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 have providing by by Anita providing that leadership, I think we have succeeded. So our thanks to Anita and all of our partners. And I just wanted wanted to uh, share our appreciation. Thank you. If you'd like to get our mailing list, please sign up, and I hope we'll see you again. And thank you again to Chaden Association. Thank you to Dr. Yangde for sharing his wisdom with us, and thanks for coming. Good night. Thank you.